And now, without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you distinguished internationally renowned architect Marion Weiss. Thank you, Federica, and thank you so much for the invitation uh, from Marco Fascari, I need to say, uh, an incredibly esteemed uh, colleague from University of Pennsylvania, for the invitation. Because uh, for, for me, this is a, a kind of uh, a wonderful link of thinking about what Canada is so noted for, and when I think about this university architecture and urbanism, what is so uh, much at the forefront of the thinking in the university is this incredible intersection between architecture, landscape, urbanism, infrastructure. And it seems that the preoccupations that have certainly been on our mind, and I know at the university here and also where I teach at the University of Pennsylvania, it has been uh, looking at the kinds of opportunities that emerge from these hybrid conditions or these kinds of his unseen histories that might come into focus when we find ourselves designing in a new place. So for the work that I will share this evening, and I'll share eight projects, it will reveal uh, perhaps the trajectory of the preoccupations my partner Michael and I, uh, Michael and Freddie and I have been looking at over the past decade. So to put things in, a, in context for a moment, uh, we began our practice when we were both working for Aldo Jurgola in New York, and we were working on a few competitions on the side, which I think most young architects tend to do something on the side. And what we were preoccupied with were projects that seemed to fall outside of typical disciplinary boundaries. And if we think about most of the competitions that are very compelling, they can't be answered just by architecture. They can't be answered just by landscape. They can't be answered just by urbanism. And they certainly can't be answered by infrastructure. But if we start to think about the increasing transparency between design disciplines and the scales that touch all of these, then we start to think about a territory of architecture that needs to concern itself with a larger territory. And we think about heightened disciplinary distinctions that seem to be affirmed by the administrative boundaries, agendas of different departments, uh, different requests for proposals that ask for engineers, architects, and all these distinct and separate disciplines to come together, it's almost the administrative boundaries that start to set up a set of blinders that allow each field maybe to forget uh, what the other might touch. So we were concerned that architecture was being marginalized in some cases by what engineers would take on or what architects might take on. And particularly when these subjects touched on public settings, we felt that there was a new kind of architecture that potentially could take on the more lateral terrain of landscape and urbanism and those connections, but still be distinctly architecture. So if you think that we designers and architects operate largely in the realm of the subjective, indeed, if we have to transform things, we need to be very objective about multiple agendas, sometimes seemingly in total conflict with what architecture might take on. So if we start to think about architecture then that goes beyond the kind of ideal, the, the unobstructed site, the perfect building, Villa Savoy, the unobstructed site, well, what we found that more recently, in recent decades, some of the most interesting projects haven't had the perfect site for the perfect object, but in fact have been in the interstices between, say, highways or train tracks or flood areas. And so we started to look at, then, maybe a way that our practice could look at, at these disciplines as a kind of cross-section that revealed, perhaps, connections as opposed to distinctions. And so the eight projects that I'll share this evening have had fraught beginnings, um, tortured paths, if you will, histories that were less than felicitous in terms of the results and the questions then that were asked were about transformation as well as invention. So if you think about transformation and invention, we have to think about objects like the chameleon that you can see there on the left if you look closely. 
an object, if you will, that's utterly transformed itself to be concealed within a setting, or even these uh, uh, military installations in Pisco Valley, New Mexico, uh, suggesting that they're part of a dune formation that never existed to conceal their own uh, agenda. In each of these cases, these two images have been haunting for us because all of a sudden the objects themselves engage and become part of a larger territory. Now, we think about, then, what does this mean, then, to be part of a larger territory? That becomes incredibly challenged when we think about topography and section. And if you look at the slide on the left with the rice terraces in the Yunnan province of China, you'll see that an act of cultivation is occurring here by the leveling of the land in series or in sequence, and in this case, holding water to be able to allow uh, rice to grow. And on the right, if we look at a project, not our own, I wish it was, Despecky's Spanish Steps, you can start to see that there a topography in Rome was cultivated, literally, in a different way. And the staircase itself was excessively oversized to be large enough for cultural infrastructure and artifact to be engaged. And this starts to interest us when we think about something of an infrastructural scale actually having a cultural capacity which is very, very different than when we think about, say, the GW bridge on your left and all of the tangle that happens when it comes down to land or something that never makes it to land. This is a photograph by Roe Etheridge of Junction Atlanta. So we start to think about these monofunctional infrastructures that bypass the very settings but indeed are heroic, they're built, they take up a lot of space, and they have a presence that can't be denied. And then, of course, we can't help but think about the present visions of people like Le Corbusier, who thought that, indeed, if there is a super scale like a highway and infrastructure, why not consider it as inhabitable with the potential of leveraging all the views that it might offer here with this extraordinary vision? So all of these preoccupations had to do with things that are part of something substantially larger. And one of our uh, fairly recent projects, the Museum of the Earth is located in Ithaca, New York, which is a landscape that was definitely formed by a geologic past with incredible gorges that came from the retreat of the Ice Ages, so that you can see here that there's this amazing gorge very near our site. And just as a bit of an aside, Frank Lloyd Wright, when he was touring Cornell's campus and being shown all the great buildings that they had created, was also brought over to the gorges to look at it and finally said, well, finally, some credible architecture. But, it, but indeed, these gorges are amazing. And so when we were invited to do the Museum of the Earth, we couldn't help but be preoccupied by this kind of Devonian past. But when we were looking at the site itself, uh, which is, faces Lake Cayuga, we couldn't have been more uh, disappointed by its less than compelling expression of this great past. Also, if you look here, this is the road at the entry of the existing uh, 1927 building, which is where the Paleontological Research Institution publications are held. We were to do a, 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 an addition to this museum and to make it a museum. And what you can see is that we had this big problem of being from the road remote, which meant parking would be taking up the entire site that you could see prior to the building and then prior to the views of Lake Cayuga. So we started to study, actually, a whole mapping of where the actual ridges, valleys, and cuts were in the landscape, and noticed that, in fact, on our site, which you could see circled with a red, that there was a cut that would make its way all the way down to Lake Cayuga, perpendicular to the lake. And so we started to think of a museum not as something that would be a box to hold their 5.6 million pieces of archaeological and paleontologically significant uh, fossils, but as something that might actually start to be shaped as a piece of land where you might, in fact, unfold an experience that operates first on the earth before it operates in architectural terms. And so what we started to do was consider the shaping of the land and the shaping of the parking as something that could simultaneously catch water and address then the, all the 50-year, uh, the 50-year, the 100-year, the and the 500-year storms in the parking lot, which then would make the concealed obligations of water detention and redemption by normal civil engineering standards part of the shaping of the site. So you can start to see that the creation of this project is one of uh, two halves of the site, allowing water to travel between 
coming together on the right-hand slide below grade into one museum and education center. Now, what we always do when we begin a project is do an extraordinary amount of research and then effectively take a break and then start to think about what is most compelling about the project. And for us, the extraordinary views of Lake Cayuga were very compelling, as was the phenomenal collection, the whole notion of making a paleontological story, which is this intersection of biology and ge geology, totally vivid and unfold uh, for a visitor. And so this question then of shaping the site uh, through water collection, uh, this engineering drawing, the civil engineering drawing, is the first time the city of Ithaca ever approved any surface water collection as opposed to subsurface collection and approved a parking agenda at the same time. But you could see that it really was a kind of section, not unlike that chameleon that we were looking at earlier, that could begin first as a road cut, then as something that shared the building and captured it, brought the water down, and allowed these things to happen simultaneously so that upon arrival here, you would not only see the building emerging as twins uh, along a valley, but you would also have the parking concealed on the right-hand side by these ascending berms. Water's collected by those berms, and the parking is, has runoff that's collected into a channel, and that channel itself uh, allows the sediment runoff to be cleansed and then make its way in the cleansed form to Lake Cayuga. Now you can start to see this feat of uh, civil engineering is really very straightforward. It uses Len Rock, which you can see right here is this incredibly beautiful flat sedimentary rock that when it's pulled out of the quarry lays completely dead flat. Um, just to put things in context, Len Rock is Cornell spelled backwards and uh, he, he was so visionary that he came up with the quarry name as a way of charging an extra service for anybody would draw from his quarry and build on the campus. You'll recognize the stone of Cornell's campus here. But just to give you a sense of scale, that's uh, myself and the director up against these berm retaining walls. And these became an interesting way to start to set up the story of the earth itself that was beneath the site. And you could all also see that even at night, the idea of this unearthing or revelation of the museum could come into focus. And the two halves of the museum are seen here, the, the education center fully illuminated and the gallery itself, just a blade of light emerging from the, uh, the berms. But that's a blade that could then become significantly more generous as it looked out towards Lake Cayuga and offer up a great contrast, if you will, to the invitation here to the valley where the water itself would pass under this channel and then allow this, uh, what was just a one-story entry to become a two-story space here with the gallery. And in here, in this gallery, you can see that there's a right whale. This is, it's literally called a right whale because it's considered the right whale to catch. Uh, but it, it's a very current, live uh, record of paleontological history, as is the glacial garden here, which the stones which you see placed around here are more than 450 million years old with fossils in them that reveal then the legacy of this uh, Devonian past right here in Lake Cayuga. But these two hidden buildings then come together in one connected uh, underground, but two wings that spill out, framing then all that runoff that's then cleansed and gathered in this retention basin. And what's intriguing here is that our idea was to actually allow the whole creation of the site to reveal uh, the legacy of this paleontological story so that the invention of it begins again by this habitat that we created with more than now 20 different kinds of frogs breeding. So this idea of nature and site and constraints, in this case, obligate, that case, obligations of water runoff and parking was something that was all about creating a sequence that we might uh, learn about unfold through site and the building itself was one topic. We had a very different kind of challenge in Northampton, Massachusetts for the Smith College Campus Center. And here there was this whole question about how do you bring a campus together in one building in a campus that is, while only 2,600 in population, is spread over so many acres that people might even miss each other. What we thought was very intriguing, though, about this particular campus, and have a look here. We've got the brick gravity-bound academic buildings, and we have the wood-clad residential buildings that form the whole campus, and a major green. 
which is part of this legacy of Olmsted, who in fact designed the campus. And so as we were looking at what it might mean to create a campus center, a curious thing came into focus for us, which was that most of the offhand encounters and real kind of easy socializing seemed to happen between classes, between going from the houses, and they were en route or on the path that Olmsted had originally set up. And so we started to think about what might happen if we took our site, recognizing that we would need to put something like 60,000 square feet on a site that was indeed too small to host that, and think about maybe three stories worth of paths that might entwine and make their way inside and back out again and connect the campus north, south, east, and west. Well, we had a lot of ideas about how to connect inside, and the idea of circulation and movement was very much in focus, but we really had no idea how to do the building. So I put this here for students who feel like they should have a linear path to the final answer. It's not that way. So we actually went back to our preoccupations about what was on our mind as we thought about what it would be like inhabiting a path, and we thought about things that might allow us to shape views or frame something that might actually be a slow down kind of you know, circuitous path that might allow us to pause as opposed to a straightaway. And then we started to think and plan about our very curious site. If you look at the top of the slide, uh, there was an historic district of small houses and small buildings that we needed to allow our building, quite a large one, to look petite and residential in nature. And on the other side, we had this obligation of the institution to create uh, a place of invitation. So how do you allow this building, like a chameleon, to be one thing on one side, something else on another, and still have an identity that was coherent? So we started to look at unpacking the program from the slenderest end up at the uh, historic street, and then have it unfurl itself to become generously scaled and open out to the landscape. So you can see with, uh, how shall I say it, 10 months of excruciation, excruciating dialogue with the Massachusetts State Historic Commission, we indeed accomplished a petite looking 60,000 square foot building, at least on this side. But as a building that opens up on the campus side, the idea is to actually acquire a stature of a building that definitely has a very large program, and one that would be open and transparent as opposed to the brick kind of opaque boxes that were the most institutional identity on the campus, and unfurl and open out onto the new green. Now, again, the idea for us of a campus center is actually a place where you can see and be seen, where you have a, a sense of life, where you want to know what's on, going on around the corner. And in this case, a three-story building would suggest that you might even need to be able to look up, across, and through, but make most generous the path itself as a programmatic destination as opposed to simply the program elements to its side. And so we actually started to think about a series of say, if you will, shelter above with the skylight, cladding of this walk, and then ultimately cladding the exterior as things that could be accomplished through meters that had maybe four or five notes that could be shifted and changed across the section and length of the building. Even the exterior, which is very simple plywood, um, is actually a high performance, probably one of the largest high performance wood buildings academically, which takes five different modules and unfolds them with battens that allow light and shadow to be captured to give texture to what might otherwise be too large of a surface. But you can see inside, the whole idea is to really see and be seen, to kind of mix it up, to make it fresh. And we even love the fact that the campus center itself had, uh, or the campus of Smith College had a phenomenal botanic garden. We were inspired by it, took photographs of it, and were interested in the idea of bringing landscape inside and what, the life inside outside. So we took photographs of the, um, uh, of the flowers, ex exploded them to be large enough to cast in resin, and then used those then to create a kind of a new landscape that would wander through the campus center en route. And so all these tables are inscribed with their botanic name and their, lat their Latin name and their vernacular name, and they line and create a kind of cafe culture along the length of the campus center. But seeing and being seen, again, allows visual connection even in the most private study areas or in the most open of what we call the garden lounge. Now, when you have a large building on a small site, sometimes you need to go below grade. And roughly a third of this program is actually uh, concealed below grade uh, into a lower level. 
Uh, and what you'll see here, though, was our concern about bringing light to that lower level, which was accomplished in two ways. One, with the skylight above that runs the length of the building, but also the excavating the earth on one side to bring light through to this lowest level garden lounge. Um, it was a tough act to uh, encourage, but it ultimately did allow the Botanic Garden to actually name this slope the Lariope Slope, and showing uh, we're showing here all the volunteers that actually put in over 1,200 plugs of Lariope to stabilize the slope, to allow light to come into that lower level. And then you'll see this other kind of curious nod, these oblique windows that only look towards the street and towards the green allowed us to maintain full privacy for the women's dorm, which was directly across the path. And so again, the building is adjusting and changing itself, and in this case, opening fully out to what's called Paradise Pond. Yes, it is actually called Paradise Pond. And so this is indeed the, the great warm hearth with a wood-burning and gas-fired fireplace as the center of the lounge, so that even in the depth of winter, and it is mostly winter in Northampton, uh, that students will actually have this great, warm, welcoming uh, place to come to in the weather when it's just like it has been recently, snowy and cold. The idea is that even 24 hours and at night, this is a place that says invitation, um, says welcome, and connects to the landscape. So Smith was a campus that actually could create a center and could host many programs in this building. But when Michael and I began our practice, we had actually begun by doing a series of pro bono projects in Harlem for schools and community centers. And so we were thrilled when Robin Hood Foundation asked us to do a new library in Far Rockaway, Queens. If any of you know where Kennedy Airport is in New York, uh, this is literally in the sound path, inches away from the airport. It's a very poor school uh, that has security guards for even uh, kindergarten through fourth grade. And we were asked if we could put a library up on the fourth floor of the building. We said that would be crazy. If they really wanted uh, reading to be part of the culture, we ought to bring that library right down to the ground floor. And because there were two gyms, a boys and a girls, we suggested turning one into a co-ed gym and the other into a new library. So this is the space. And what we started to think about was, if kids are really going to get pumped about reading, then we have to welcome the kind of turbulence that's at stake with the way they learn. And so we started to think about lining this with a, an inhabitable bookworm, if you will, something that would uh, be a mediator between the circulation areas outside and the uh, cafeteria, but inside offer an ever-changing potential to the space for reading, for teaching, for speaking, for learning. And that idea of this inhabitable bookworm then came to being with co the, the full collection of books embedded in this wall and uh, the ones that couldn't be embedded on moving bookcases, which you see uh, on the, uh, the left-hand side. We also designed the furniture, rolling beanbag chairs, which you can see right here. Um, and the librarian was very excited about them until the students became too excited, and so breaks were added. Um, <laughs> But if you look here, the idea of deployability and flexibility was really central to what the librarians wanted. And so these bookshelves that were uh, stacked on the left-hand side could be completely consolidated so the room could be open for all kinds of events. And we indeed were very interested in the idea of this being changeable enough so that even a, a place where students might read could actually have a different kind of life. You can see this theater scrim here with a kind of crossword puzzle. If this curtain is fully closed, you can in fact read these words at different scales. Uh, just to put things in context, we originally wanted a, a velvet curtain that would allow students to completely hide, and the librarian said, absolutely not. But you can see that it really is this idea of allowing many, many worlds to occur within this one finite room. And this is indeed our favorite image here, which is in the reading, uh, in the reading room, within the reading room, within the reading room. These are students enjoying their, their beanbag chairs. But this one particularly challenged environment actually has its companion, another kind of uh, center for culture and learning, which is at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, a current project which just began, or just began, just had groundbreaking actually a week ago with moving some trees. And here in the middle of Brooklyn is a very curious and a very tough environment also. Uh, but one inside, you can see above the kind of tough environment outside the Botanic Garden, but one inside the Brooklyn Botanic Garden is this phenomenal landscape, this discovered Alice in Wonderland 52-acre piece of nature. 
And what they wanted, though, was something that would take that forbidding arrival that you saw there and introduce you to and tell you the story of what's in that botanic garden, this phenomenally well-curated setting, and, and take this idea of a visitor center for us was saying that we really wanted people to go through this visitor center but immediately find themselves launched into this uh, world of landscape coming from this urban edge out to the center of the garden. So you see these series of study models. We were actually just trying to work through the exercise of getting people to the middle of the garden and away from the edge, but also allowing that experience of going from that urban edge into the park and into the garden as one where the emphasis of nature would, would emerge slowly. And so you start to see that we thought of this in series of layers, uh, layers of inhabiting the topography of the big hillside that separated uh, the urban condition from the garden, a series of pathways that might take you through there, and a series of routes, and in this case, even uh, uh, conservation routes that would allow this kind of simultaneous uh, journey, being a kind of inhabitable topography, an inhabitable route, an inhabitable path, a sequence that would allow you to unfold this story. You can see this uh, model. Uh, a, a kind of a chameleon section again that could unfold and be generous at the city side and then kind of insinuate itself in the landscape. Structurally, I thought it'd be interesting just to share the shop drawing base for this section that then gets embedded. And you can see from top to bottom this moment of being nothing but landscape at the very top and being nothing but architecture at the bottom. And so you can see the arrival now on, on your left. And on the right, you can see this inhabitable topography. Just even the roof of this becomes an experimental garden for the botanic garden and adds effectively their 11th garden. But it really is more about this idea of exhibition being legible on, on the interior, but the focus being, in this case, on the exterior, which is the garden itself, which you can see then the building itself unfolds and emerges as some, somewhat of a hybrid between a greenhouse, a topography, a landscape, and a new lens to this garden. So again, this question about what do we do when we have a very special site with a very special landscape, with a program that in many ways does not want to offend but wants to leverage the potential of a site in a way that can be compelling and smart and not overtake something sensitive. We were invited uh, with five others to do the competition for the Taekwondo Cultural Center in Muju, South Korea. This is about four hours south of Seoul. And one of the things that was so strange about this particular question is that they wanted to put this new center, which has an arena, a school, and a healing center, smack dab in the middle of uh, an ecological forest reserve that can't be touched. So when they gave us their master plan. They felt that what they ought to do is just build in the valley where it was easiest to build. And that was their programmatic mapping of the arena, the school, and the, um, uh, the healing center all over the site. And what we looked at was that these waterways were very, very interesting, and that we weren't so sure that the valley was the right place to put this center. And in fact, what we started to notice in our tours of the site and in the tours of the area is that this act of cultivation of terraces, in fact, in this area, ginseng, which is which is it's famous for, was not happening in the valleys, but happening on the edges, not on the mountaintops, not in the valleys, but somewhere in between. So we started to think about the potential of structuring the site and structuring this new uh, Taekwondo center as some place in between, offering then a new landscape that would connect it all. Now, it's worth saying that what became interesting for us was this strange conflation of this amazing site and this amazing subject. Taekwondo is not just a martial art. In Korea, it really is something that embodies mind, body, and spirit. It's an act of discipline. It's a spiritual kind of reckoning. And it, and it is, in fact, practiced by everyone from very early ages. So we started to look at this strange connection of the of the, all the films, we couldn't stop watching these Taekwondo movies. And we went frame by frame by frame and saw this amazing choreography. And we started tracking that choreography and found that there was an inter interesting coincidence with the topography itself. And then started to look more closely at the kind of programmatic agendas of this 24-hour site. And in looking at these things, we started to say that continuity would be central. And that somehow, if we could actually organize this 
by body, mind, and spirit, we could actually have the arrival off the highway be the body uh, with the arena, the school be the life of the mind, and the upper terrace of the healing center represent uh, the spirit. So that led to this very curious mapping, if you will, of body, mind, and spirit in these contours, and then started to look at then the kind of reaching of this very, very steep site, how to reach one piece of the valley from the other through a series of bridges that would cross that valley back and forth and connect both sides of this inhabited site. The simplest bridges were at the beginning and then the most complex and delicate uh, up at the uppermost part of the site. Then we decided to really leverage the water that's uh, tearing through the site and create different experiences, both wandering and rapid, or even still and reflective at the arena. But the real question was, how do you operate in this very steep terrain? And so we actually looked at cultivating and developing a new kind of cultivation, you know, not just ginseng, but in fact, a new kind of wonderful garden to explore with water, with growth, with topography, with architecture, so that even the arena here was one that would unfold and unfurl almost like a new sort of flower. In this case, uh, a celadon glaze inspired uh, flower uh, on this new reflecting pool that collected all the water from the very top of the site to the bottom. The, 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 the mine, the school of the training center, was one that then took that next sectional valley cut and clad its edges and allowed something to become continuous, in this case, continuous enough because this is a famous ski resort area too for those uh, who are pursuing cross country to even pursue the surfaces of this area. And accordingly, also the baths and the, and the pools are very important. And so you can see here in, the, in this uh, school and training center, the competitive sized pools. But then of course, when the weather is nice, outdoor training grounds are very important and actually organized training is what you see uh, on the uh, ascending terraces in the center, center and the research center cantilevered over the valley in the middle. But at the very, very top, the spirit zone, which by the way, uh, we could only reach through the sharpest zigzag rope path, um, and I was not feeling so spiritual when we reached the top of it, was one, though, that was quite amazing. And actually, where the water races down the hillside, we started to collect it in the series of water terraces and made the last bridge that crosses the valley the most fragile, the most tentative, the most tensile. It's one that indeed is the most extraordinary because it brings into focus the entire site, but pulls you completely away from the architectural interventions and puts you back in touch with the extraordinary nature of the site. A nature that we would say has now been brought into new focus then by the creation of this uh, new setting. I'll tell you a little anecdote. They started construction uh, this September. When we found out that water wasn't always present on the site, we spoke with the, our client um, and said that we were a little bit concerned that they would need to be bringing water to the site and that we could rethink our design so that water would be a temporal phenomena. And they explained that it was not a problem. There was a river a mile away, and they had already found out the cost of pumping the water from that river all the way to the top of the site. So much for green architecture. Um, but this, uh, this question of green and the question of nature and the question of leveraging things that might be barriers is something that is very fresh on our mind for all kinds of our architectural projects. And in this case, the Creative Arts Center Barnard College is one where there were phenomenal barriers keeping the campus from feeling like it was one campus and keeping the campus from feeling connected with the city of New York. You can he see the classic gates here. Barnard, as some of you may know, is the women's college that is affiliated with Columbia University directly across the street. And <clears throat> these are its gates. But its campus is a unique one. While Columbia is very, very urban with the Grand McKinley White Steps, uh, Barnard is very intimate and it has a green at the heart of it. At the very top, you can see Lehman Lawn, and below its historic origins were all focused in this one building, Millbank, with an historic courtyard. Now, when they wanted to do a campus center, they had done a campus center in 1968, and you could see they decided they would put it between the green and between the historic building, along with a science tower. I don't think you need to guess where the 1968 interventions are. But that white box was our site, and we were told that that building, which was only 35,000 square feet, we were going to replace with a new building, which was 100,000 square feet. And our feeling was that it was bad enough that in 1968 there was a barrier 
that separated the green, the, the historic uh, courtyard, which you see, see at the bottom of this image from Lehman Lawn, that great lawn that I showed you earlier, that this, that this campus center indeed had created a full physical barrier by one plaza that connected the tower and the campus center. It was also, by the way, a brutalist image here and one that was not exactly welcoming to the campus. Now, we started to think about what would a creative arts center be, programmatically be 24 hours a day, but if you start to think about what it means when it's 100,000 square feet, that means it's vertical. And when you start to think about the challenges of a vertical building, when you're trying to get a kind of cross-disciplinary interaction, what you discover is that there's floor-by-floor -floor social segregation that goes on in all academic buildings. We thought that this would be terrible for a building that has drama, architecture, fine arts, painting, uh, the, and, and also uh, hosts the uh, reading room for the library, uh, black box theater and event space, a cafe, a dining hall, uh, and classroom. So our question was, how could we simultaneously make one landscape scale gesture and connect the entire campus together across the landscape and also connect this entire program together? So we started to think about it literally as a strategy. We looked at the original box, which they said was our footprint, and we said that box was too fat, and it was separating the two sides of the campus. We made that box slender. Then we said that we would have to do a few layers below ground and take over some parking, which was a big debate. Then we looked at what it would mean if it were a slender box all stacked up, and we had the, the thought then to actually create a carved, uh, slipped atria all the way through the building so that a landscape scale gesture would allow people to see and see across the site outside and inside the building. That gesture then would allow Columbia University in particular across the street, but certainly New York to see the vibrant programs of drama, of architecture, of painting, uh, sort of thriving in this 100,000 square foot building. Now what became intriguing was to think about how this big building could somehow almost feel smaller on the campus than that original campus center did. And that slender facade here now 44 feet wide instead of 100 feet made all the difference so that you could see it opened up back to Millbank, which had been hidden before, and opened up to the lawn. Now, easier said than done to actually get what amounted to 107 different programmatic areas that needed to be separated to feel as if they were together, it took a few agendas first in section to think about how they might reside with each other. Uh, the lowest level that you can see here in blue, it's a black box theater that's at the very lowest level, which seats about 100 and allows the kind of drama program to have a full venue for experimentation. But the next level inside that you see somewhat in orange is straddling between an above grade and a below grade level. And that is the event space itself. You can see it nearly done with construction here. That seats 500. This photo was taken because we actually had the building inspectors check to see if it really did seat 500. Um, but the wood itself is acoustically treated with a series of uh, score lines that allow the kind of acoustical challenges of, of circular spaces and oval spaces to be handled by this slipped uh, wood skin and also the acoustic reverberations held behind. But then the real question is, how do you actually make visual connections all the way through, not unlike Smith, where people would be inclined to want to know what was going on in other parts of the program and building? So it was this slipped atria, which we see here in gray, was our stroke of trying to bring into focus, say, from the cafe here all the way up to the architecture and arts gallery a visual connection through the programs and across the programs. So you can see these were our early renderings, and this is a very fresh and not quite complete space that you can see here of what it's like today. And you can see this, we're looking down on the reading room with the study carols through down to the dining room, down to the cafe, back out to the lawn. But the idea is that at the uppermost level where we're standing in the gallery critique space, somebody could actually have a sense of where they are in the building and a sense of what's happening in the time of day. We also said that the circulation areas shouldn't just be circulation areas, they should be a little bit larger than usual, large enough to be able to allow almost these kind of bumper cars of, of, of tables and, and seating areas to make their way around the building. And this is actually 
This is when the building opened, uh, did a soft opening very, very recently, a student supplied balloon. You can see that, the, that these kind of offhand encounters we were encouraging at Smith, we're also encouraging here and furnishing them with soft seating. But it really is a question of how do you take this slender building as narrow as 40 feet at one end and as wide as 100 feet at the other and allow this kind of connection all the way through from the campus side to Broadway? How do you clad it? How do you think about how it participates on the campus and feels like it belongs, but also belongs to the future? And we started to look at what was surrounding us on the campus, which were largely brick and historic structures. And then we started to think about something more forward looking like glass, which would have a capacity to maybe be in dialogue with that brick, but not be brick. And so we did uh, a look at how we could have something that would have maybe five different types that could be deployed in what would amount to an, uh, an unlimited palette so that we could have large windows and lots of them where we needed them and almost none where we didn't. And that then led to this building, which you can see the idea of the section all the way through, the lawn connecting the two ends of the campus connected and then ascending through and clad in this exterior material of externally acid etched, internally terracotta colored glass that we then did about a year of experimentation with our colleagues in Germany to see how we could in fact get this glass to behave as if it was a collaborator, but in fact have ability to change. So what you'll see here in this next slide is some of the first mock-ups and the color of the glass indeed, which you can see right here, changes depending on the light and the angle. And you can see that sometimes on the right that it's as dull as copper if it happens to be in one kind of shade condition or in another as bright as red. That creation, you can see myself here with our, our uh, uh, curtain wall consultant, we're looking at the mock-ups right there in situ on the site. That change in color is created by the two-toned, five-inch deep uh, box, if you will, shadow box construction with a copper, the copper colored glass on the outside and four inches back, a fire engine red back pan. That allows this building to change its color, change its appearance, depending on the time of day. And in this case, you can see it's almost bleached and copper and almost metallic. And then another time of day, it starts to go red. We then actually looked at that uh, soft pattern that we were getting, almost a beach glass quality of the uh, translucent lights, and then ran that frit, if you will, across the vision lights, the clear lights that you see reflecting the sky here to create a new assembly. Now, Let's go back to this issue of what we're seeing and being seen. This was the campus as it was with the, uh, the Macintosh Campus Center in full division. And this idea of creating connections came into focus here from Millbank, where we kept the sight lines from the main gate to the historic campus in line. But what you can start to see is climbing up the side of the building is a staircase. Uh, our client fondly calls it the most expensive and inefficient fire stair they've ever seen. But what you can start to see was that we envied the Midwest for the big crisscross, you know, walkways over their big quads. And we did say, though, that it was those crisscross walks that were quite fantastic. And if we could take that idea and turn it vertically for this urban campus, we could actually engender the same kind of dialogue and views of the campus in our own way. And so what you start to see is that the that that ascending uh, green belt, if you will, that connects two halves of the campus also ascends on this side into a staircase, one that inscribes itself through the programs. And on this side, you can see that there's programs that need very, very little light because we're facing the tower. But the staircase itself with the uh, crowning uh, and most important program facing the main lawn, the senior architecture studio, which you see cantilevered out the front, or the main classroom on the upper level facing the historic mill bank are brought into focus here. And this is it. I mean, the building is, is just barely opened, and we're still completing the punch list. I hope you all know what the punch list means, which is uh, finishing touches that uh, now, in our case, add up to 102 pages. But this is the staircase. And this, again, uh, brings you back to what the campus had as its facade uh, to New York and to Columbia with the campus center, the former campus center, and what it has today. And so this is now a very, very recent uh, photo of it, finally built and constructed. It's just been opened. I hope you all have a chance to see it if you get to New York. 
but it really is now um, this incredible unveiling of what Barnard really hosts as a university and a college to New York. And so this question now then of how do you take these ideas of barriers, of constraints, of obligations, of challenges, and actually not make things disappear but come into further focus, comes into focus for our proposal for Toronto's Lower Donland, not so far from here. I'm sure you know the watershed, which is heroic and extraordinary, uh, that, that channels into uh, Toronto's main water, watershed, the Don River watershed. But we were very interested here at the idea of dual natures. If you could say there's one very, very amazing natural kind of phenomena that defines this part of Canada and this great urban vitality, the question is, what do you do when you look at this amazing watershed and think about the fact that you've got about 600,000 people living in this watershed in, in this most urban of conditions? And if you think about Toronto and its formation, you, you realize that it was indeed this incredible collection of wetlands that over time, particularly with industrialization, became filled in. And that watershed started to get choked off, so much so that with, in, with, the, with its industrial heritage, these canals were formed that choked off the natural flow into these skinny little channels that could support industry. That agenda, of course, was ineffective and severe flooding, and you can see this image here in 1954 where Hurricane Hazel uh, brought torrential rains, uh, raised the water level uh, five to six meters and wiped out much of what was in the area. And you could start to see that this question about how you deal with flooding that's continuous could come into great focus in this, uh, at this base of the river, uh, which would all, all, if you look closely in this channel, get choked off, that huge watershed could get choked off in this one channel. When Toronto held this competition, they said, we want to naturalize the Lower Don, but we also want to make sure that we're creating a new kind of, uh, uh, kind of ecology here that will be welcome, uh, both urbanistically and ecologically, in this industrially unfriendly area. What we started to do was look at the flow of the river and, and track the flooding patterns over this site and started to figure out how we could allow that river flow to slow down and also, if you see here with the, the, the green series of playing fields on the lower part of the slide, slide, allow extra flooding that might not make it through that channel, uh, wash across sporting areas as opposed to inhabitable areas. And we worked with uh, a great group of hydrologists, ecologists, uh, engineers, landscape architects in Canada to really make sure that we understood the simultaneous challenges of keeping transportation moving, keeping water moving, keeping flooding channeled and allowing contamination in that area not to be pulled forth. So what you can start to see here is this incredible tangle offering itself up visually back to the core of the city. It's a phenomenal site with the, the Gardner Expressway causing, if you see that slight curvature on the right, the elevated Gardner creating great bifurcation between the, the, this site and the core of the city. We started to say that if we were to look at this part of the city, it's a place with no greenery, and it's one that actually needs to channel the river, naturalize it, channel flooding, but bring a new recreational, both passive and active recreational identity to what will become a virtual residential and work community. This was our vision uh, for it, but as we start to look up close, things like the Isabel Stewart Gardner Expressway, which you see on the right, which they, in many cases, think of the floor and then you sit down, we think is architecture for free. It's fabulous, but it's even more fabulous if you start to think of it in great contrast now to the naturalized channel. And so here we are sort of uh, bringing together now a new wetland ecology and passive uh, walkway area to then what, if you see over here, is more of the Isabella Stewart Garden is uh, great magic, which we adore. And we think it's especially fabulous if you can think of it adding one more layer of infrastructure down here with a series of pedestrian and biking pathways and pull the river ecologies up to the surface in this naturalized condition. So it's not so much antithetical, but even more exciting with the introduction of nature. And this is the overspill channel. You can see that they really couldn't do much of anything here, but we carved a deeper cut, if you will, for that long run so that a series of playing fields would have, say, if you will, on the hillsides, free seating by the amphitheater cut that was created there, but also a floodable area that wouldn't uh, affect any of the construction to the left or the right. 
But perhaps most phenomenal about this site, and we do think of sites as having many identities, is in fact its incredible relationship to the city. And we love this uh, tour that we had, albeit through the snow, because it was about great stillness and beauty across the water to this heroic skyline beyond. And so our, our most important introduction then was saying that we could take a boardwalk, not one boardwalk that just makes its way out to the edge of the water, but one that elevates itself and opens up, can be seen and be, be inhabitable, so that inside cultural events could happen, but topically when the weather is good, we could actually have this uh, natural outcropping or destination on this part of the city. Um, you'll see that we actually love the idea of um, open campfires on the beach, and we were told at our presentation that that was not indeed legal in Canada. But <laughs> there it is. Um, but, uh, but this last project, which is the Olympic Sculpture Park in Seattle, is one that really brings together all of these preoccupations of saying that things are not one thing or another, but one thing and another. And in this case, this particular project was very, very exciting to us. Uh, the Seattle Art Museum said that they wanted to create a sculpture park free and open to the public on the last waterfront property in downtown Seattle. And when we read about it, we thought, that sounds really lovely. When we looked closely at the competition brief, we realized that this was not one site, but three, divided by a four-lane arterial, high-bodied, wide-bodied federal trucking route in the upper section, and then Amtrak and Burlington uh, Northern train tracks dividing it from the water on the lower level, a 40-foot grade change, and to make things even more excited, fully contaminated because it used to be a storage facility for Union Oil of California. Now, this was not a site that was innocent in any way. And in fact, its innocence was fully lost when the Denny regrade was put in between the late 1890s and 1930. What you're seeing here is the hosing down of the dramatic bluff that used to meet the water into what Denny, a great pioneer of development, realized is that if he hosed down the bluff, he could actually create up to 70 new acres of land across each block and acquire all this new real estate this was seriously unenvironmental. And on the right, you could see that those, you see those high uh, elevated mounds, I'll just point them out, this, that, and that. Those were the property owners who weren't initially eager to sell their properties. <laughs> but, if, but if you look at this site, and I'll just put things in context, the actual original water's edge was right here on Elliott Avenue. Uh, when the sculpture park uh, framed the competition, they said, what we'd like you to do is green up these parcels, and we think that we can get a couple of wonderful artists, artists like Sia Armajani, who'd done bridges, to get a couple of bridge, bridges offered by the artists to help kind of allow uh, the artists to shape the infrastructure here and for you guys to do the park. And they said, if we had maybe a little bit more money, we could do what Millennium Park did, which is cover up all the infrastructure and get everything fully connected, but they weren't sure. It was somewhere between these models of fully co covered or uh, three separate parks with two cool bridges. We thought that both were overlooking what we thought was a phenomenal site. So we started to say, what if the forces of infrastructure, all those north-south movement agendas, uh, what if they actually played a role in what might be shaped on this site? And what if, indeed, we can add one more layer to the site that would literally unfold from the city to the water's edge and slow down your experience of the site by adding one new level of infrastructure? So that what you could start to see is this our, our first kind of seminal sketch here was our idea of saying, OK, the museum needed to have an exhibition gallery at the city end, and that the city of Seattle said that if we could create salmon habitat at the water's edge, we could get up to $2 million in federal grants. That's an odd sort of juxtaposition of things. So what we looked at was the idea of adding one new layer here, a kind of landform that would begin at the city and unfold and wander literally to the water's edge and somehow uh, take up the 40-foot grade change, cross the highway, cross the train track, and lead everybody to a new accessible waterfront beach. And so this is what it in fact looked like. Um, not so very different than the original competition drawings. And you could see at the upper end of it, you could see the pavilion itself, which is where exhibitions and a cafe are, uh, joining a kind of collaborative dialogue with the city. And down at the very bottom, you could see a beach 
where we tore down the seawall and indeed created a new salmon habitat. I'll get to that later. So it gets down to the image of a chameleon, if you will, that very first image that I shared with you, which is how could this feel as if it actually belonged in the city, belonged on the water's edge, but brought something altogether new that transformed itself along its whole sequence. We thought about it in layers. And if you could look at this series of layers here, the lower layer over here had to do with maintaining the trolley, the road, the highway, the train tracks. This layer here had to do with maintaining all the remediation wells for Uni Oil of California. This layer here, uh, uh, what adds up to almost two and a half miles of infrastructural backbone along the length of that so that any art could be done and it could be electrified, watered, or wired. Water collection that would collect all the water from the site and bring it down to the uh, shore. Series of paths, both direct and indirect. And finally, a new landscape for art. So if we start to think about all these layers then, the real question is, to build this up, we needed to create an earthwork. And to build this earthwork, we needed to actually uh, layer it in sections. And our very first ideas had poured in place concrete walls. The walls themselves exceeded the budget by double. So we actually brought on a highway engineer who gave us some incredibly fabulous tips about how they do their highway overpasses with MSC, which is mechanically stabilized earth. And so we built up these layers and then clad them with these precast uh, walls, which you can see in the drawing. Here you can see the MSC baskets being built and created, the gabion, if you will, set back. And then you'll see this kind of concrete set of panels, which we had fabricated, as you might be delighted to know, in Canada and brought down to Seattle. But you can see that they exceed the height of the earth by about 42 inches so that we would get, in effect, a new guardrail or handrail without having to introduce that extra layer of architecture that would become competitive with the art. But we love these walls, and these walls were done staggered, not, not poured in place as we originally thought, but through our engineer's recommendation, staggered and overlapped so that in seismic events, and Seattle is seismically dynamic, that they could shift and move. But what we loved is the way they actually caught light, brought nature into focus, and indeed actually created an incredible dialogue between here the meadow grasses of one of the terraces and the calder, which was the first work that was brought to the park. Now, crossing Elliott Avenue was something that was not easy. That's uh, four lanes of this high body, wide body. And so we needed to achieve a 20-foot clearance here. But our comment to ourselves was, that's a remarkable thing to cross a highway. And we ought to have a remarkable point to let us know that we've made that crossing. And so we actually nearly convinced the uh, transportation department to put one of those tripwires down so that the museum could count as extra visitors each day anybody who went across this highway. But what looks very dramatic and very uh, sort of infrastructurally demanding on this level is one that's barely perceivable except for the reiteration of this point above for on the walkway. But this curious zigzag, the importance of this zigzag, is that if you can see the pavilion off in the distance uh, in one direction, you could also see Mount Rainier off in the other distance. But the idea was that views are fabulous everywhere in Seattle, but if you actually create this zigzagging path, each particular view's qualities are brought into distinct focus before you turn in another direction to discover something altogether different. So that even coming down to the train tracks, we actually realized that we needed to have a bridge that was quite a bit thinner than this land bridge that you just saw, because each one of those beams, which are 110 feet long, cost $55,000. So each one of those beams then in double, double in cost then when you actually install it. Each beam we found out cost $100,000. And then when you actually make them tense and spring off, they cost $150,000. So this bridge you see is slender, there's the thrust, but dramatic. And there you can see it crossing the Burlington Northern uh, trains of Santa Fe, but we also discovered that there was a train spotting community too. And so this extension of the bridge, this little cantilevered element allows those train spotters to have a view. We had to, by requirement, have a throw fence that not only went up vertically 12 feet, but went horizontally 8 feet to make sure that cans and bodies were not making their way over to the train tracks. And so we worked with artist Teresita Fernandez, who did this phenomenal piece called Seattle Cloud Cover, uh, to uh, fill that in. But you could see on the other side, we had a very 
slender piece of property. So we actually had in one direction an accessible route, but in the other a dramatic, and once again an ode to our love of the Spanish steppes, a dramatic amphitheater down to uh, the Alaska Way Viaduct. What you can also see, though, look, look at that gravel that you see below. We'll get to that. But that has to do with the creation of stabilizing the seawall here, which was very unstable. And you can see that in this very slender area where I talked about water collection, this, this area right behind this gentleman's bench is a kind of a new wetland habitat where all the water that gets channeled through the site makes it down to an irrigation channel here and opens out into this newly found beach. Now, just as an, as an aside, the great thing about this is that this literally does mean that there is one place in the city of Seattle where you can actually walk down to a beach and put your toes in the water if you first. This was a hardened uh, shoreline. And when we originally designed and did the competition, we actually uh, had all these uh, ideas about all the logs that we loved and all the shorelines, and we couldn't afford logs. So we only we bought about 11 of them and anchored them on the upland area. Right before the, the park opened, there was a major storm. So all the ones that you see here in the forefront came in for free. But it was, in fact, the creation of a subsurface habitat that allowed us to get nearly two million in federal grants. And what you can see here is the kelp beds here for juvenile salmon. And we had not one salmon specialist, but two salmon scientists to work with us. And what we discovered in the end is that juvenile salmon are no different than our, 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 our sort of human peers, which is that they hang out in groups, and they hang out together, and they're very selective about where they go. So this is indeed the habitat that they go to. But this question about nature, urban life, infrastructure, in the lens of art is truly exciting. And so you can see that the art program is one that unfolded where we had the great luxury of collaborating with almost all of the artists with the exception of Calder on the uh, creation of the placement of the art. The first piece, though, the Calder Eagle, was what was acquired and became the beacon. And you can see that it really offered phenomenal views of the mountains beyond. Uh, it's called the Olympic Sculpture Park because of those mountains that you see, the Olympic Mountains. Uh, but pieces like the Calder uh, really had its, how shall I say, competitive opposition from Klaus Oldenburg's eraser. For those of you under 25, this is not a pizza cutter. It's a typewriter eraser. Um, but you can see it's never looked more dramatic running down the hill. And then again, you can see Teresita Fernandez's uh, cloud cover piece in the fence that we designed, actually creating a wonderful staccato with all the layers uh, from the three different parcels connected here. But that piece itself is a wonderful place, a kind of uh, up close, uh, it offers a strange abstraction that these kids here uh, are enjoying when they walk across. But that artwork has its counterpoint with another young artist, Mark Dion, who's an environmental artist. And he worked with us to locate his Seattle Vivarium, and we, in fact, designed the enclosure for him so that he was able to bring in a 70-foot rotting nurse log from the, from the uh, forest, the Olympic forest, to be located here with a roughly 100-year rotting lifespan in this great urban condition, offering up incredible new life in its uh, supine uh, location here. You can see that the green roof itself there is emulating the, uh, the quality of life that you get in the forest. And the roof itself actually bring, uh, breathes and does all kinds of phenomenal things to allow this growth to thrive. But thriving with things around it was something very, very different in Richard Serra's mind. You see this uh, valley area with his five uh, beautiful pieces here called Wake. Uh, originally, that valley area was going to be uh, slender or smaller and was going to host all the kind of um, sort of classic contemporary modern works that the museum had. Um, Richard Serra was uh, told that they were very excited about his piece and they had identified a home for it nowhere near this valley. And he said, I'd like that valley, and I'd like all the other works out of it. He got his way. And you can see that this is coming from a storage facility in Long Island. The piece was like the, the kind of the, the sweep of elephants that come for the circus, uh, marching all the way from Long Island, New York, all the way to Seattle. But you can see them being assembled here. There's Richard uh, during the first anchoring. But what was great about working with an artist like Richard Serra was that we were able to work in models in our office and collaborate with him, but also, in his case, build in flexibility. The foundations for these were oversized in length and width so that while it was being placed, he could actually eyeball exactly where it ought to be anchored in situ. And so that's what you can see here. Those are anchored in situ and form this really phenomenal uh, 
experience because in the valley you're literally 20 feet below the level of the city and in this kind of strange forested area that allows his work to be not so much collaborating with the city but being part of the city at a distance. Now what you can see descending into this valley is the amphitheater of the Skolsk Pavilion. And this was, by the way, um, a very interesting opportunity for us to allow uh, our very natural lawn to look utterly unnatural with the work of Ioli Alessandrini, who did this phenomenal laser show, um, which you can see here, so that at night, our um, beautiful natural lawn looks like uh, iridescent wall-to-wall -wall astroturf. Now, Pedro Reyes, uh, another young Mexican artist, did this phenomenal piece that you can see here uh, he did this wall mural on one side, and you can see in our pavilion that there's a, a kind of classroom meeting area on one side, but it really opens out very generously uh, to the views of the mountain. And those are the suspended cupelas that are places that you can cocoon yourself literally and, and swing inside the uh, gallery with this installation. Now, you may recognize that unfolding diagram that shapes the site in the form of the building, and the pavilion itself in many ways is just a kind of, uh, uh, almost like a fractal reiteration of that unfolding that you saw the site so that it too can open up. And you can see that it really is a kind of layering that we like very much, which again is never a direct route, but indirect. So the experience of the site and the building is always something that feels elongated and long and relaxed as opposed to short and speedy like everything around it. But that short and speedy, and here's the the root up, you can see the Space Needle above, um, and you can also see this building itself unfolding so that it can accommodate below grade parking for 70 above grade portals for the city. Um, and finally, actually, with its material quality, be again a bit of a chameleon with this folded brush stainless steel that takes on the characters of the city around it, the road around it, the sunsets around it. And you can see that we actually tested this material in all these various light conditions from dawn to dusk, because the one thing about Seattle is that you can get 11 seasons in one day, and we wanted this skin to actually, the skin of the building to capture those seasons and the traffic around it. So that you can see sometimes it goes steely gray, and other times it's nearly white. But then, even in the transparent glass areas, we worked with a translucent mirrored frick pattern so that it would be ephemeral, reflective, and diaphanous. And again, as it comes around, in this case, that unfolding section that you saw allows this lateral kind of definition of the site as opposed to the vertical buildings around. So finally, to return to what our own preoccupations have been and have been sustaining ourselves in our teaching and in our practice is how can we actually think of architecture as something that transcends those boundaries of the object on an undifferentiated landscape to be part of that landscape and part of shaping and changing that landscape. And so finally, it is to the end of inviting a whole new kind of cultural identity to a site, to a setting, to infrastructure, to art, to landscape, that is uh, finally, I think, the biggest adventure for all of us. And so I think when we reflect back on what it is that we are most excited about, I think it's the fact that architecture has a, a capacity to um, really transcend and transform rather than just define and refine. And ultimately, I think uh, we hope that that adventure for all of us will continue. So thank you. So thank you very much for an amazing lecture. And uh, if that's all right with you, maybe the audience will have a few questions. So there are two microphones on the two sides. Maybe we can turn the lights up. So while they think of their questions, maybe I can ask the first one. And um, I wanted to ask you about this. Uh, you talked about the research and how you, you do the research and then you take these breaks. So there is the kind of uh, thinking and doing, I guess, and this interplay between the two, and also in your practice and teaching, and to understand a little bit more about the process and the way that you work through the design. It's actually, um, it's, it's a very interesting question because I think there's nothing linear about architecture, nothing linear about design. And what we try to do at the beginning of every project is to take a kind of 
a cross section through all the research of the history of the site, the history of the topic, the history of the place, and in fact try to understand absolutely as much as we can to inform our intuitions and then forget about it. And then, you know, it's interesting, Alvaralto used to go and do a painting, go into it's not like he's doing a painting of his project, he would just do a painting. Uh, sometimes we'll go out to a bar, have a drink, talk, forget about it, not think about it, mess around a little bit, and then start to work intuitively so that it really is not so much this kind of linear research and then you design, but it's you research so that you can relax because your intuitions are always your most informed response, but you want to make sure that you add to that informed response through your research. Thank you very much. I'll ask one more question, and, uh, and hopefully, I think it's important also for, you know, for our school and, and for the students. Um, you know, at the school, we try to be uh, bilingual, so both digital and analog, and we think they're both really important. And I wanted to ask you in your practice, uh, again, what's the balance between the two, and how do you work? Between well, I, young people? it's very interesting. I mean, if you all are sort of anywhere near my age, you were not learning architecture with the digital uh, sort of framework. And if you're in school right now, you can't do without it. And what I feel very grateful for is that now we have all these mediums to study things. And because so much of our work is preoccupied with sequence and with section, the digital environment allows us to really test that cinematically. And in a lot of our work, we're actually doing animations just as a way of studying the work. But we draw and we make models and we also know that the digital environment, as agile as it is, can have predispositions because of a programmatic capacity to make curves, for instance. Um, but also, the, the analog environment could also have predispositions. And so each medium has predispositions that you want to value and learn from, but you must go between these to actually find the tensions between. And I think what we've learned now is we can't do without any of them. I think we have one more question, Professor Ben Gianni yeah. from the School of Architecture. Yeah, I went to school with a lovely young woman who used to um, accuse of not drawing with her hand, but rather drawing with her elbow, uh, <laughs> that every drawing was just remarkably gestural, and I find a lot of affinities between uh, that kind of drawing with the elbow and gestural qualities with your work. Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, full disclosure, Ben and I were classmates. <laughs> Um, and, and indeed, uh, Ben knows that uh, I struggled with many of my projects and would tend to uh, do all the well-disciplined inkline drawings that Ben could do exquisitely and then feel somehow like I was missing the absolute core of what I wanted in a project. And I would have to return to charcoal again and again to find, find exactly what I needed. And for those of you who are sort of digital bandits, if you will. You might not know this, but that when you draw, your wrist allows you to take on one kind of a, a shape or a form. Your arm from your elbow allows you a different scale of gesture, and then your forearm from your shoulder altogether something different. And all those kinds of rotational capacities are things that become part of your physical memory, the way you can actually work and draw, and then finally a line, which is very precise. And it seemed somehow important, as Ben has touched on, to be able to utilize all these kinds of um, operations, if you will, so that the kind of intuitions were also physical intuitions as well. And so it's perhaps not surprising then that the scale of the work that you see is super scale. That's the shoulder stuff. That gets down to a medium scale from the elbow and down to the wrist when it gets refined and down to the furniture, that's the line. Thank you so much. Thanks for that. So thank you all very much for attending. This was the, the last lecture of the series, and we are going to be looking forward to see you again next academic year. Thank you very much.